Greetings. I'm so glad that you all were able to join me for this session today. My name is Jessica Silva, and I will be talking to you today about how to teach geography to the littles. <laughs> and just so you know, when I say littles, I pretty much am talking about those ages eight and younger. <laughs> all right, so as you can see, I got a lot going on, right, as we all do. Um, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm um, an educator. I am currently an adjunct professor at the University of the District of Columbia in Washington, DC. I'm also a trainer, facilitator, let me see, instructor, consultant, um, hospitality, education, and customer service professional. Yeah, all that. <laughs> um, and I have been homeschooling now for Oh, well, I've got a 16 year old. So I guess we can call it 16 years um, because we've definitely been uh, involved in his education from the start. So just to give you a little background um, on my family and how I kind of came into the way um, that I instruct, especially in regards to geography, I uh, just want to give you some background. Like I said, I have one son. Um, there he is. Uh, yep, that belongs to me. He is 16 and he's been homeschooled all of his life. And, you know, when we first started doing anything in regards to formal learning, shall we say, um, we just kind of stuck with those basics, you know, your letters, your numbers, your shapes, and your colors, right? We wanted to make sure he had that going, you know, really strong before we kind of maybe hit him with anything else. Um, but we really began to just use, even with those basics, you know, the things that we had available on hand, you know, the resources that we had already in our home, the educational things that had already been purchased, or gifted to him. And those were the things that we used to begin to help him on his journey of education. Um, we did speak to him in English as well as Spanish. Um, so he's pretty good with his Spanish at this point in his life. Um, actually also taking French now, um, but you know, able to get him to learn about not only himself, um, but everything that's in his environment in his world. So as I, we'll get into. Um, I have always, and, and you know, my family as well, have taught from what we consider an African-centered perspective. Now, a lot of people may see those words and think differently um, about what they mean. To our family, when we say African-centered perspective, we're more or less speaking about a way of seeing yourself in the world through the lens of being an African person, right? Irregardless of whether you live on the continent or elsewhere in the world, um, you're still an African. And so all of the culture and the memories and the ancestors and everything comes along with that. And so that was pretty much our first foray, if you will, into geography, making sure that he was really clear on the continent of Africa, um, that that's where he came from, and about all of the wonderful things that are in the continent and of the continent. And so we used to make sure that he knew the shape of it, you know? So Africa, just like a lot of all the other continents has a very distinctive and very specific shape. And we made sure that he would use things in the home to recognize Africa. So we used to play the scavenger hunt games. Um, and I do these in my classes sometimes as well. Um, go and find things, you know, that you can say are related to something and or look like something. So in this case, it would be Africa. And so with our scavenger hunt games, we'd have him, you know, go around the house and find things, either items or images, or pictures, a book, um, even pieces of jewelry, because I know I still have my uh, sorority uh, tiki that's shaped like Africa. <laughs> uh, um, and, and, you know, he would bring those things to us and, you know, we give him points. Um, and so that would be a little game that we would play. Of course, as he's gotten older, um, he's of course got images on the computer and different things, you know, but it was that one day when I think he was, I think it was around two, maybe two going on three, um, where he looked at one of the maps that we have in our home and he pointed right to Africa and he said, Africa, you know, like he knew it, you know, he was solid. And so that was really kind of the beginning where I realized, okay, I can, you know, start teaching him about the world. Um, and geography has always been just kind of one of my, you know, loves um, that I came from with my own education. So the first thing that we made certain to do, and um, I think it's important for any family, especially a homeschool family, uh, to have one, 
is to make sure we had a world map uh, on the wall and to make sure that we had a world map that he was able to access. In other words, we didn't put it high on the wall, you know, we put it really kind of halfway um, on the wall so he could physically be able to go up to it and point out different things and really feel comfortable with knowing that he could find uh, things on this map. Now, this one that I'm showing to you is my preferred um, map, if you will, for the world map. It's also called the Peter's Projection Map. Um, and it goes by a couple of different names out there in the world, but mostly Peter's um, is the name you'll see associated with it. And the Peter's yes. maps are known to not only, of course, have everything you know, that's in our world laid out on a map, but also have the dimension correct. Whereas there are some maps, um, and you might even look at the one you have in your home now if you have a world map, and you'll notice that, you know, Africa seems a little bigger than South America, but not too much. On a lot of maps, um, it doesn't really give Africa and all of the continents, really, their proper sizing, especially in relationship to one another, okay? And so with the Peter's projection map, I highly suggest if you can get a copy, um, they are still in um, in, in able to be purchased uh, somewhere out there in the internet world. Um, and you can get them, like I said, full for your wall. You can get um, sheets that you could give to students um, so they could keep that are notebook size. Uh, but it is really what I feel is one of the best world maps out there so that you can really correctly from, you know, the start of things, be able to see the sizing, of uh, the proper sizing, shall I say, of the continents against each other, okay? So if you look here, you can, of course, see how large Africa truly is. It is the second largest continent. Um, of course, Asia is the largest. And, you know, you'll notice that its size very significant, as you see in comparison to South America. Um, it is definitely larger um, and very visible so on this type of map. So personal suggestion, um, but if you're able to get yourselves a Peter's projection map, uh, I think it is definitely a great investment. And I would also say again, that if you're going to put your world map up on your wall somewhere, to make sure that it's accessible to your children, make sure that they can go to it and they can point things out and they can plot you know, distances and things. But they can actually look as well as touch and feel it um, because it just like anything else, right? Makes it more of a real experience for them and they're able to tap in even better. So, um, in regards to teaching about the world and geography, uh, like I said, started with my son and we used to make up a song and it's actually become the song that I now sing and do with my students uh, currently. And it's a song about the continents and it has all of the continents in it. And it also has movement that goes to each continent. So every one of them has some type of an action and it's a great way to not only help children learn their continents, but then even teach them to others. Um, and I've seen it happen in families where I've taught, you know, with the older sibling now has already taught the younger sibling, even though this younger sibling is first time in my class, they already know their continents because it was taught from the older ones. Um, and if you know, just like anything in life, right? We remember what we sing, okay? Um, if you caught the tune, you can sing something from, you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, because you remember, you know, the rhythm of it. So we, we did that. We did the continents chant. That's what we call it. Um, and so for, you know, North America, we put our arms up and we go North America. I always remind the children that that's for not only North America, but up as far as a direction on the map. Whenever you're looking for North, you're going to look to the top, right? You're going to look up. Um, we do South America. We do our arms going down, right? So it's South America. Um, same thing with the directions again, your direction for south on a map is always going to be down. Um, we do uh, Antarctica, we clap that out. Um, I'm big into words that have a lot of syllables for little people, but they can still say them. Um, but sometimes you have to kind of clap it out to get them to catch all the syllables. Uh, so Antarctica, we do that twice. We'll do Antarctica, Antarctica. And then um, when we're well, when we're in person, I use my legs for this one. When we're virtual, I use my arms. And so for Asia and Europe, it's just, you know, one arm or, or leg or then the next. So it's Asia, Europe. If we were in person, we'd use our legs and kind of do like a semicircle. 
with right leg, Asia, Europe, right? And then we get to Australia. And the move for Australia is to swim like a fish. Um, I remind them always about that movie, Finding Nemo, and how in that movie, that's where it was located, right? In the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so we're gonna swim for Australia. And then um, I, my favorite continent, Africa, is uh, bringing up the rear in the chant. And it is three times that we do this. Um, and I refer to it as um, our Wakanda pose, because um, of course, every child is very familiar now with the Black Panther uh, movies and characters. And so we say, Africa, Africa, Africa. We do it three times, then we end, and we make a little sound, <laughs> and we do our Wakanda pose, um, just like the Dora Milaje do. <laughs> so, you know, that is something that I will do in every class. And like I said, I have had students um, you know, send me videos, uh, like I said before, they teach the younger siblings and show their parents, and then the continents are something else you can kind of check off the list. Okay, well, we know that. Um, I do also introduce the compass rose to children because it was, it, I think it's very necessary to know about directions, right? Um, I live in Washington, D.C., so for those that know, uh, Washington, D.C. has four quadrants, Right? We've got Northwest, Southwest, Northeast, and Southeast. And so, you know, there's addresses that can possibly be found in all four quadrants, unless you put the quadrant on there, right? So your mail, in order to get you to the right place, your mail has to have your quadrant. Um, so as we th thought about DC and my, my son, you know, getting out and getting older and riding his bikes and all that and knowing where to go and where he is, the compass rose had to be introduced because that's on every map, right? We got to know our direction. So with the compass rose, um, I remind the children to make a plus sign. I did it with my son, um, how he can draw his own compass rose. Um, of course, I remind them that it's not a rose, actually, it's not a flower. Um, but maybe some people have compasses on their watches. Maybe their parents have them um, or they have the, the Swiss knife you know, gadget that has the compass and all the other things. Um, as far as what it is, I let them know that a compass, of course, is directional, right? And so once they're able to make that plus sign, they can draw two lines and make that plus sign. Lines don't have to be straight, of course. I let them fill in their compass rows. And that's exactly what we did with our son. So let him put the N for north, right? The S for south, the E for east, and the W for west. He's got his letters down at this point, right? So he's writing and he's practicing. Um, a little layered learning kind of going on there. And then with regards to the directions, we also would do um, a little movement again. We would do it with our arms. You know, I was like, okay, well, show me north with your arms. You know, you have to put their arms up. Uh, show me south, put your arms down. Um, east and west was always a challenge, right? Because sometimes <laughs> children may take a moment to get their left and their right together. You know, and so if we were doing it one way and it was supposed to be the other, I'd say, oh, no, your other left, your other, the other east, you know, so we figure it out. Um, but looking at the maps, they get reminded that the compass rose is always going to look the same wherever you may have it on the map. And those directions help you to figure out so much, not only on maps, but in life later when you start getting around in this world. Um, oh, you know what else we did was the compass slide. <laughs> And so the compass slide is, not to be confused with the cha-cha slide, but that's pretty much where the idea comes from, um, is so, you know, take it to the north. And so with the, for the north, you're walking up, right? Take it to the south, and then you walk back, all right? Take it to the east, you should walk to the right, right? And, you know, you should walk to the left for east, for west. So these are the kinds of things that helped him get excited about learning about the world. Um, knowing all of his continents, knowing his directions, being able to show, show it off and show someone else. Um, and these are still concepts that I use in my classes now with my real geography students. Um, but like I said, my son was probably, you know, two going on three, um, where he had these concepts already solid. Again, his letters, his numbers, his colors, and his shapes. Um, and that helped him to be able to look at the map and be able to make these next steps. 
So before I talk more about my uh, particular classes that I do for world geography, um, I wanted to share another piece of how I tied in geography to something of interest to my son. Um, I have a friend who kind of gets me to this idea. Uh, she has a son as well, and he was completely into basketball. His life was basketball. And so she realized that in order to get him to have an interest in some other educational topics, that she kind of had to bring them through the lens of basketball, right? And so whether it was counting and doing, you know, multiplication, you know, she would do it in regards to how many baskets he could make, you know, this time versus Tuesday, last Tuesday when he worked on it and different things. And she would just do visuals. His, his worksheets would have, you know, images of basketballs and hoops and different things on them. And so it really, really helped him to tie in more to the information as well as be excited about the topic, right? And want to do the work for it. And so as my son got older and got into video games, um, he, you know, found this game. I think it's still going on. I looked up, I looked it up recently and it is, I think it's been over 10 years actually now, um, but it's called Subway Surfers. And so, you know, at first I'm looking at him play the game and I'm just trying to figure out, oh, wait, what are you doing with your character? And what it is, is that the characters go on this world tour and they go to several major cities um, throughout the world. Um, and I guess you could say they go to every continent except Antarctica. And they go through the subway systems and the train systems in these, in these cities. And they're looking to kind of get away from the enforcement folks because they've been um, making really nice graffiti <laughs> on the walls of the subway stations and on the trains and such. And so, you know, that's where the, the chase then ensues in the game. Um, but what I noticed as a homeschool parent is how I could tie this into his geography studies, right? Um, so as you can see here, they've gone to these cities and many others, but, you know, so they were in Paris, France, they were in Seoul, in Korea, um, they were in Mumbai, in India, um, they did some U.S. as well, um, they did Venice Beach in California, they did New Orleans, um, they went to China for Beijing, um, they hit Europe again for uh, London and Zurich, and they even went to Marrakesh. Um, so I was happy to see, um, you know, some locations that this game was traveling to. And, you know, as a homeschool parent, or as my son at least says now, we have to turn everything into a project. Yes, we do. <laughs> and so we began using, you know, our world maps and our United States maps um, to plot out the cities that the subway surfers were going to. And we ended up having, well, not having, I guess I assigned it, um, to do a unit study on those cities, right? And some of them, such as Zurich, I wasn't particularly knowing of, you know? I mean, I knew of it as far as, you know, the name, but I didn't know much specifics about it. And so it helped us to learn a lot about those places that we may not have otherwise invested in. Um, so, you know, we would do a unit study that included, of course, knowing the continent and country. Um, and then the flag was a big part of it as well. Um, my son now is really doing well with recognizing flags from all over as to what they relate to in regards to the country. Um, and the flag activities, we would do coloring sheets. We would put them together with the little pieces of, of uh, rolled up paper, you know, different ways and paint, all kinds of ways to make flags. We definitely made sure he knew the capitals of those countries um, and reminding him again on maps that they're usually identified by a star or some type of indicator. Um, probably his favorite part was going through the foods <laughs> from these places. Uh, we would make at least one dish um, that we were able to make uh, from these places and tie that back in. If it wasn't the national dish, it would at least be a popular you know, food item uh, from that place. We also definitely focus on the animals that were native to that area. Um, and we would do crafts after that. We'd make sure that we did, you know, little puzzles or, um, I'm sorry, not puzzles, but little pop-up uh, figures uh, for the animals. We'd make sure to show habitats. Um, and then any other cultural details, you know, if it was a manner of dress, if it was any particular events or holidays that they celebrate in that particular uh, country and or city. And that just gave us a really good knowledge base around the world and some areas, like I said, that I might not have otherwise even given a project about or information on. The other thing 
that I think is a wonderful way um, to add onto the learning time and putting in additional things that children may think is fun and enjoy, but they're also getting reinforced with the learning. And I call that layered learning. I don't know where the top, I, don't, I guess I made it up. You know, maybe I'll have to trademark that someday. But when I say layered learning, I mean that there is, you know, more than one learning objective or outcome um, that's going to come out of what the child is, is doing. So we would take, of course, puzzles, world map puzzles and put them together. And maybe he had to identify them by color in order to put them together. Um, drawings were always a part of it so that he could tell me again what he got out of the lesson. So draw me a picture of the most important thing or the most memorable thing you got out of learning about um, Korea, you know, and he might just show the map or the flag, excuse me. And that kind of thing really helps me see, again, that check for understanding. Um, so I really appreciated being able to not only you know, get a little insight on his video game life, um, but also see how we could then take that and relate it to our learning. Um, so Subway Surfers, who knew that could be a geography tool? <laughs> um, all right, so getting back to me talking about the classes that I currently do uh, with the Young Learners for the World Geography. Uh, I teach at the San Cofa Homeschool Collective in Washington, Washington DC. And we are an African-centered homeschool group. I'm actually the co-founder. Uh, and you know we have a huge mission and vision um, as many organizations do, but ultimately we just want to you know, pull that brilliance out of our young people. You know, the genius that is intrinsically inside of them already um, and show them that they are a strong part of you know, not only their own culture, but world culture and how to really utilize their talents, their skills, how to you know, bring them forth and find out what they are not only interested in, but what they're great at doing. And you know, everything was going well with Sankofa. We started it back in 2011. We were in person and having classes. We had a couple of different locations. Um, as we grew, we had to move. And then like a lot of us, here comes COVID. You know? So as of the spring, of uh, 2022, no, 2020, um, we had to go back and bring our classes online and make them virtual. And so we were able to bring them by mostly Zoom, right? That was like, and it still is, right? The hot thing to do for uh, virtual life. Um, but we had instructors, you know, choose their online platforms and we started to, you know, do classes online. And so I did the same and I brought my world geography class uh, online as well. And like I said, I teach ages four to eight and a lot of people will look at that age range and I can understand them thinking that it's really a wide age range, right? That's pretty, that's, you necessarily wouldn't have a four-year-old in a class with an eight-year-old. Um, but what I do is think of the one-room schoolhouse kind of mentality. And I also make sure that in each lesson that I make sure I teach um, and, I, and I pull something out and I offer something that teaches or attracts all of the top four learning styles. So you, you're familiar with these, visual, right? Auditory, um, read and write, and then kinesthetic. This way, if you're doing something that covers all of these learning styles, then you're at least somewhere in the lesson getting an opportunity for the child who is dominant in visual to have something to look forward to, those who are dominant in kinesthetic be having something to look forward to, and otherwise, okay? So the, the chant is still a part of my classes, the continents chant. Um, so those are the kind of things that help um, get them moving and grooving at, right at the start of class. And, you know, there's a lot of other things that I do as well to incorporate the learning styles into uh, the class. So maps are definitely a big part of my geography class. In fact, that is one of the first things that we look at, uh, depending on whatever our topic may be. Um, there's maps um, of the continents, maps of the countries, and sometimes even further breakdowns of maps of cities. Um, and we look at all types. So we show maps that have 
um, the mountains and ranges and the rivers and everything pointed out. We show those that had the cities. Um, we show maps, like I said, of the continents and see how they may be next to each other. We also show quite a few videos. And when I say quite a few, I don't mean that my class is video heavy. What I mean is that I usually show one to two videos. And I try to keep them three minutes and under um, if I'm showing a video. My, my ideal video time is maybe about two minutes actually um, to get a short point you know, across, but again, allowing for my visual learners. So now you saw the maps and now you're relating it to some moving pictures um, and something that actually can you know, help your senses to connect with the topic and material. Now, auditory folks, that's where call and response comes in big time for me. Um, I feel like it's an uh, uh, ancient African way of, of instructing, um, or maybe it's just my family was always, you know, making me repeat things. But, you know, again, this is for repetition. And we all know, again, repetition is how a lot of us learn as well. Um, so for call and response, I definitely have them repeating things after me. Um, whether it's definitions of a land form or habitat or, or, or you know, a particular geography term. Um, but I always make sure that there is some call and response, some uh, repetition happening um, audibly for our students as well. Read and write. <laughs> um, I love a, a folk tale, <laughs> right? I mean, this is one of the best ways, you know, to get the children to um, make a connection with either characters or a particular area that you're going through. Um, we do spelling exercises as well. Um, after the continents are really solid with the students, I start asking about which ones start with the letter A, you know, what is, you know, the largest continent, but the, you know, has the shortest name, um, Asia, right? You know, so I get them to really look back again at their world map and at their materials and figure out, you know, what spelling is happening here? What's the difference? And why can I make a connection between this story and that place? Um, so that's what helps for the read and write aspects for the learning styles. And one of my favorites, kinesthetic. You know, kinesthetic learners are the ones who gotta be up and moving, right? They gotta be doing something with their body. They have to have their hands busy. And I particularly love those because I think that's in all of us, you know, at some point, you know, we've got to put our hands in something, we've got to touch something, and we've got to move our bodies. And so that's where, again, the songs come in, the movements, um, you know, I will do the compass slide, like I said, you know, we'll do things with our directions, maybe sometimes even with directions when I'm visual, uh, excuse me, when I'm virtual with students, we use our heads. So instead of our arms, because I might not be able to get all your arms on the screen, so we do it with our heads. So we'll do up for north right, down for south, you know, to the east, and then to the west. And then I'll say, okay, we're going to get a little faster, right, because now we're moving our heads, and at some point I get a cane or my hair style messes up. So, you know, but they love it, you know, they really do. And then they start teaching me, oh, well, let me show you, I can show you all the directions. Um, and again, we're using, you know, movement, we're using songs, so they're repetition and things that they'll remember. And again, this is a great way um, to work with our students who need to get up and need to touch and feel. You know, the hands-on part of things is, is very real. The other thing I do for um, the kinesthetic learners, by the way, is making sure that there's some type of a craft, right? Um, it's usually, you know, something relatively simple, if you will, but it's something that they can actually put together for themselves and then be able to showcase later, okay? Um, and it's always something, like I said, that, you know, particularly speaks to the topic at hand and what we're learning about. So there's, you know, I don't know if you all realize, but geography is not usually taught until middle school. Yeah. And, you know, so regardless of what you may be doing at home, and certainly, you know, the continents, you know, have come up earlier and the oceans and major things. But as far as truly delving into geography, um, it doesn't usually happen until middle school. And so again, finding ourselves as homeschoolers, being able to pave our own way, um, I am a big proponent that children can learn geography as young as three as, and four years old. Um, it's, it's really very empowering, I think, 
for a child to know their place in the world. Um, it's literally like, where am I? In, in the, when I see this world map, where am I at? You know, how do I fit in? Um, and I love that we do sometimes the me on the map uh, lesson as well, right? Trying to figure out, okay, how does this all branch out? Here I am in my house, on my street, right? In my neighborhood, and then in my city or town, you know, in my state or my region or my county. And then I go out to my country and then my country is part of a continent. And now I see where I fit in when I look at that world map. You know, and I like to keep the learning, you know, pretty tight in. So right now, um, you know, I'm only doing like one hour classes. Um, I'm keeping everything kind of tight. And so that's not too much time for people to, you know, start to get, you know, otherwise interested. Um, but, you know, this is a solid on one of the first lessons that you need to do for geography, right? The continents and the ocean. Okay. Um, I'm showing this picture here for a reason. So Whenever I show pictures of continents and ocean, I always make sure that it is a brightly colored map, just like the one we have here. This way, I also get the children, whether it's in person or virtual, to be able to designate exactly and, and point out where these continents are, okay? So if I was to be on this map with students, I might say, all right, so, we talked about Asia. Everybody remember Asia? You know, Asia is our largest continent, okay? Can somebody tell me if we put our finger on the continent of Asia, what color is it? What color is it on this map, you know? And so they can tell me, oh, it's yellow. And I might do the reverse if I'm dealing with students who are, are just starting to learn their continents. Can everybody put their finger on the yellow on this map? Do you see the yellow part on this map? That's Asia. That's the largest continent in the world. It has countries like Russia and China, and India, Thailand, Japan. Have you heard of some of these countries? You know, and that's the other thing. Ask them have they heard of them. You sitting around watching the news, they might be hearing some continent names and some country names. This is where they make these connections and start to realize, at least in my opinion, that the world is not really that big, okay? But yeah, colorful maps are a great way to engage your young people and really get them to practice, again, even another part of layered learning. So now we're relating your knowledge of colors um, to this map, which is of the continents. And so you're able to locate all the continents on this map. And that relates to what we've been talking about in class, as well as when we're doing our chant, it all kind of comes together, okay? Now, <laughs> I, you know, want to make sure that children, when they're in my geography class, are using the proper terms. And, you know, I make sure they know that the earth is, is not a circle, right? Because you may ask some students, you know, well, what we all know that we live on the planet earth. And they'll say, yeah, we know. Okay, well, what shape is the earth? It's a circle. Nope, it's not a circle, right? Because a circle is a flat shape. Okay, um, we all know as adults that the earth is actually a 3D shape called a sphere. And yes, I make sure they say it, put the V in there, right? For the PH and sphere. <laughs> um, and, you know, they're reminded so that when we look at these maps in class, which are flat, you have to kind of keep in the back of your mind that, well, actually the earth is, is a sphere, it's round, right? It's like a basketball or a soccer ball shape. Um, a lot of times I'll even pull out uh, one of my smaller globes. Um, I have a, a kind of kitty one, if you will, and it lights up. Um, and I'll show them and see if anybody has ever seen one of them and even ask if they know what it's called. This is, is this a map? Well, yeah, but they call it a globe, you know? And this is a way that they can truly see how, okay, yes, this is what the earth looks like. So if you haven't seen a picture of it or if you haven't you know, seen one of those space um, you know, um, pictures from space that you can see what it truly looks like. And again, I remind them also that we will be looking in class at maps that are mostly flat maps. And so you, they have to think in their minds and I tell them to take their face out like a ball and flatten it out, right? And so this tells them that this is why you're gonna look at things a little differently, but keep in mind that the earth is a sphere. 
Um, I also remind them, I actually did this in class earlier, um, that a lot of times on many flat maps, uh, world maps, you'll see two Pacific Oceans, right? Because you'll see, you know, Pacific Ocean, you know, over on the maybe left side of a map that's showing um, the west side of uh, North America. And then you may see Pacific Ocean also on the right side of a world map that's over by Indonesia and China and over that way. Um, but I remind them that there's not two Pacific Oceans, right? There's just one. Um, but that again, they've taken the sphere and they flattened it out, okay? Um, so these are the kind of things that I use, again, to give them concepts and visions of why something is appearing one way and how they can modify their thinking to remember or use it in a different way. So I remember um, my first class <laughs> um, in person and remember teaching just this simple concept, right? It was, I always say, I've got big questions for them. These are big questions for the little people. And I say, what is geography? You're in geography class, right? So what is geography? And they'll kind of, you know, I'll be looking, you know, but then I'll show them these kind of pictures. This is what geography is. It's the study of the earth, right? And so that can cover so much, you know, but ultimately, it's a science. And I remind them that we're talking about everything on the earth. So whether it be the continents, you know, um, of course, all the oceans and other bodies of water, um, people, um, cities and places, animals, of course, um, different habitats and environments, you know, from rainforests to deserts and things. This subject of geography covers everything that their world involves. And so we're going to have all kinds of conversations, but this is what, like, and I can feel like I see it sometimes. They're just like they opened up because now we're going to learn about everything on the earth. Okay. And I really think getting children, especially again, your little ones to understand that they have a place in this world and they have so much that there is to learn about that geography can be touched on in almost every other subject. Okay. I, I guess I have to say this too. I, I, I really feel strongly about speaking to children and, and young children as well in proper terms, right? In proper terminology. Um, just like when, you know, you have to teach your children about their body, right? Using proper terminology. Um, but explaining, of course, in words that they can understand that are on their level, right? And you're not going to explain something to a three-year-old the way you would to a 13-year-old, of course. Um, but this is a really, really good image showing uh, what I show to my students in regards to landforms, right? Um, we do not always do landform lessons, but I usually do at least one to give them a good overview as to how many there are out there. And, you know, there's so many images that they can see. This is just one that is showing a variety of landforms kind of within one area. Um, but a landform, this is what I use for, for their definition. Like it says here, a naturally formed feature on the earth's surface. And again, this is something I would have them do a call and response on. But if you look at the picture, we're able to point out, okay, we've got plateaus, we've got glaciers, Volcanoes are, any child loves pretty much to talk about volcanoes, um, even though they can be so damaging. Um, they talk about lakes, um, jungle, uh, peninsulas, right? We talk about islands. Um, we even got into um, archipelagos recently. Um, and so whenever I'm giving these definitions, I also make sure sometimes to incorporate movement again, right? And so I tell them about the equator, about this imaginary line. And I tell them, you know, they have to think about there was an imaginary line if their head was the earth that goes around from the middle of their nose all the way to the back of their head. <laughs> and that divides their earth, right, or their head into the top half and the bottom half. And then I'll have them say northern and southern hemispheres after me. So again, they can get the proper pronunciation and say these words themselves. With island, I love to make them, you know, tell me that it's a body of land. And then I put my arms out and say, surrounded by water, right? It goes all the way around. 
um, habitat was one we did recently um, in regards to where any plant, animal, or living thing may be. Um, we were talking specifically actually about the Amazon rainforest. And, you know, I reminded them that there might be some leaves and trees um, or leaves of trees in the Amazon rainforest that are bigger than them, right? There are literally fern leaves out there that are bigger than this four-year-old or this five-year-old child. Um, and they get a big kick out of that. Um, of course, they're always interested. I had one student really interested in the anteaters and the ant relationship in the four rainforests because I said, the ants are always going to win. The anteater is bigger. I said, trust me, the ants will be here <laughs> no matter what time it is on the earth. There'll be some ants. <laughs> but, you know, he got to see a video like I was talking about before with the learning style where he can see those things and see them interact and see them interact in the rainforest, which is a habitat, right? So we kind of do, again, with this layered learning, getting them to see how everything can connect, but doing it in different ways. And so they're even practicing other skills and most definitely their, their you know, their constructive thinking skills are, are happening. And before I, I, I go, I, I have to share this with you because like I said, my kinesthetic people, um, you know, and some of us, you know, I say it that way because some of us look at the kinesthetic learners um, that are around us and think, oh my goodness, right? You're so busy and you're always moving and grooving and you're doing something. Well, this part of the class is always for them, um, but mostly everybody seems to enjoy it, right? So maybe you got a little kinesthetic in all of us. Um, but these are some examples of the geography lesson uh, show and tell, right? The crafts that we'll do. And so they're simple, like I said, um, but I say meaningful because they reinforce what we were talking about in the lesson, be it, you know, a, a city, um, you know, a focus on a country or a particular animal. And, you know, this gives them an opportunity to showcase their creativity, okay? Um, I give guidelines. I may even give, you know, templates. And I always make an example. The pictures that you're looking at here are my examples of the crafts I will show to my students. Um, so they can get an idea of how it could look when they're finished. Um, but, you know, since going virtual, I've realized that we have to, we really have to fine tune to do things that are template driven, you know, where people can print it out um, and cut and then create from there um, or assemble them. It's just been much easier that way. And then that also makes it so that if I have in this virtual world, a student who's in Africa, as I do, a student who's in Atlanta, Georgia, as I do, um, a student who is in, where else do I have students? Oh, I have students in New York, you know, so that they won't, I won't have to send items, you know, crafting items to them. Um, so most of these are done with construction paper, uh, blank white paper, uh, templates that can be printed out, uh, craft templates, um, and of course, good old scissors and glue stick. That's kind of, you know, some of the basis of what we need for class a lot of times. Um, if there's something special or something extra that I may be doing as a craft, I'll let the parents know ahead of time. But most of the things you're looking at can be done right around the house, right? Um, we've got uh, a picture of the compass rose um, that we did. Um, and this is just a simple paper plate compass rose. Um, but again, reinforcing the directions and how to figure them out and keeping them for yourself. So now you have something if you wanted to make out which way is the kitchen from my, my bedroom. Is it to the north? Is it to the east? Is it to the west? Um, and the children will do things like that when we're doing, you know, map your neighborhood or map your house type of exercises. Um, I did a um, very simple craft for the uh, pyramids um, for Egypt where, you know, we took a big gold um, um, pyramid or triangle shape and, you know, we just cut it across and then they had to build it, right? So they had to cut out these pieces and then they had to build their pyramid. And of course, we referenced how did the pyramids get built? You know, that was part of our lesson when we talked about Egypt. Um, of course, the kangaroo is from the outback of Australia. Um, they were really um, happy to to be able to put the baby in the pouch. Um, so this is actually a little 3D craft um, that we ended up doing. Um, if you look above the, the kangaroo, you see um, we definitely did one on Paris, on France, and that was the uh, Eiffel Tower. 
and they learned about why it, you know, was created and why it ended up sticking around. It wasn't supposed to. They were supposed to tear it down, but um, they did not. And so, of course, we know what a, a landmark this is in the world now. The cactus is actually from a lesson we did on Aruba. Um, Aruba, of course, being in the uh, Southern Caribbean, um, being what's known as mostly a, a warm place, um, but also has deserts. And so that was something that the children weren't aware of. We made these great um, cactus uh, crafts. Um, cactuses do have uh, plant, uh, plants and flower life on some of them. Um, we did a Kwanzaa craft. You can see the Panara there. Um, we did the Earth Day craft, is the one you see that looks like the Earth. That was for celebration of Earth Day. So the pieces of paper that we were using were recycled from old strips of uh, construction paper that we had around. So we did, of course, blue and green and made um, our continents and our oceans for Earth Day. And we, of course, always have to um, do wonderful projects for my favorite continent, Africa. Um, so this was uh, the importance of masks, <coughs> excuse me, and the meanings of them in Africa. And so we used a brown paper bag and we used various masks and we had a great time showing what this mask, you know, the one that I chose on my puppet, what was it for? And so we did a puppet show with them. And so these again are really simple, but they're very focused type of uh, arts and crafts that again, anyone ages four and up could do, um, even a three-year-old. Um, again, so these are the kind of things that I do to help reinforce not only the lesson overall, but again, to speak to your kinesthetic learners and to allow for creativity. This is a picture <laughs> that I took, um, actually when we did our Egypt lesson where we built the pyramids. Um, and as you can see, it's from Zoom. So this is one of my virtual classes. Um, but you can see, you know, if you look to each student, how different, you know, their projects came up to look, but they all look beautiful, right? Um, I'm even seeing now as I look across um, Akriye and Akin's um, uh, one, they had the, the clouds kind of in the middle of the, the pyramid, right? Um, you know, kind of streaking across because of, think of how big, you know, the pyramids are, right? If you're looking up, you're definitely going to see some clouds pass. Um, but this is the kind of way, again, you're allowing them to use their own creativity. And I point things out. I love the way you did with the clouds there. I like that you have your pyramid, you know, a little off to the side. Um, oh, that map looks great. I see it on your wall, Wazir. You know, oh my goodness, look at you all doing the, the flag for Egypt. They look so nice. You know, so I'll give them that reinforcement, but this allows them to be seen. It allows them to be seen, to be heard, and to express their individuality. And again, a check for understanding. So to wrap it all up, <laughs> I am a firm believer that geography can be taught to the littles, okay? Ages eight and below, you do not have to be in middle school, sixth, seventh, eighth grade to finally, you know, get your geography lessons together. No, all it takes, in my humble opinion, is some willingness, some optimism, and some enthusiasm. <laughs> and maybe these teaching tools that I've offered today could help as well. So remember I talked about using your available resources that are on hand, whatever you have at home. We all have construction paper, we've got tape, we've got glue sticks, right? Um, most of us will have at least one map or you can find a map. Um, use what you have on hand. Um, go to you know thrift stores even and see if they have any continent puzzles or things that can be put together to make a world map. Those are the kind of things that'll help reinforce for the children that I don't need a lot in order to make my lessons come to life. Now, I talked about layering the learning a little bit and looking for those opportunities where you can do something in addition to maybe your first or second lesson outcome, but you can also do things that will help to further connect their learning. So whether it's, again, doing that puzzle, but it's done by colors. Um, maybe you're sorting, you know, all of the countries, maybe you have them in some sort of sort of a puzzle and you're sorting all the countries that go into Europe, all the countries that are in Africa and so on. Uh, the learning styles, the learning styles, the learning styles. Please don't forget about them. This is something as homeschoolers that a lot of us have got to ensure, in my opinion, that we tap into. And that's just focusing on your child and seeing the way that they look at the world so you can better accommodate the way that they learn. 
Um, so, you know, incorporate the visual things. Incor if you incorporate all of them, then your, your bases are covered, right? The visual, the auditory, the reading, write, and the kinesthetic. All of those opportunities that you have to really get them to do things that are either hands-on or they're using their eyes or they're doing repetitive things or they're writing something out. Those are all good ways to make sure, again, that the learning opportunities really get across to your child. And lastly, always, always allow and praise their creativity. Allow for some time for you to look at what they've done. Tell them what's great about it. Ask them questions. Have them explain to you, you know, why did they put that item there? Or, you know, what does this mean over here? Or why did you color this that color? You know, give them an opportunity to explain why they did what they did. And you'll see that learning come all the way back around. Yeah, geography is, it's literally to me, is opening the world up to our children without them maybe physically having to go see it. I hope that this has been helpful for you all. I hope that this has been, you know, maybe some tips you didn't necessarily think about or that you're, you know, like gung-ho to go teach geography now because you have to realize not only is it gonna help, you know, the children, but it may help you as well. There's some places in the world that us adults don't know about. And so we can find more out about them together and just in completely enjoy the journey. So happy homeschooling, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.